Many see the slogan Black Lives Matter, or BLM, as a noble plea for equal treatment under the law. It's a cry to secure the rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness for everyone. But what does the Black Lives Matter organization actually stand for? To find out, look no further than their leaders. Alicia Garza, Opal Tometi, and Patrice Cullors. Here's Cullors in a revealing 2015 interview. They actually do have an ideological frame. Um, myself and Alicia in particular are trained organizers. Um, we uh, are trained Marxists. Visit the Black Lives Matter website and read the list of demands to get a sense of how deep a transformation they seek. One of those demands proclaims, quote, we disrupt the Western prescribed nuclear family structure requirement by supporting each other as extended families and villages that collectively care for one another. We can't be certain, but it's hard to believe this radical agenda is what most signed up for when they made that hashtag Black Lives Matter social media post, or that every employee, customer, or shareholder at Nike endorses a disruption of the family. Garza first coined the phrase in 2013, the day George Zimmerman was acquitted of murdering Trayvon Martin. Her friend Colors added the hashtag and joined the words so it could travel through social media. To Medi, created the digital platform BlackLivesMatter.com. According to Robert Stilson of the Capital Research Center, the group became a self-styled global network in 2014 and a fiscally sponsored project of a separate progressive nonprofit in 2016. This evolution has helped embolden an agenda vastly more ambitious than a national defunding of police. The goals of the Black Lives Matter organization go far beyond what most people think. They're hiding in plain sight, there for the world to see. If only we read beyond the slogans and the summaries of the movement they helped to create. It's a distinction with a profound difference. Their radical Marxist agenda is bent on supplanting the basic building blocks of society, the family, replacing it with the state, and destroying the economic system that has lifted more people from poverty than any other. Theirs is a blueprint for misery, not justice. It must be rejected. Welcome to BLM, The Making of a Marxist Revolution. Please welcome our host, Genevieve Wood, Heritage's counselor and spokesperson. Good evening. Thank you all for being here. And we want to say hello to the over 1,000 people who are joining us online for tonight's program. We're delighted that you all are with us. And I think you already see from the video that we played what a serious issue this is. And we have two very serious people we're going to talk about it tonight and take your questions as well. So I want to say about these two folks, they're not only are they people who've done the research, they've had the courage to speak out about it. And as anybody who's followed the issue of Black Lives Matter or the debates over critical race theory know, many people feel silenced. And so I want to say thank you personally, I know many of you would as well, to both Mike Gonzalez and James Lindsay, our guests tonight, for their courage and their dedication to exposing this issue and trying to get America back on track. So let me introduce our two distinguished guests tonight. First of all, Mike Gonzalez, who is my colleague here at the Heritage Foundation, is a senior fellow at Heritage in the Allison Center, which we're in this evening, for foreign policy. Uh, prior to joining Heritage, Mike spent over 20 years as a journalist, working much of that time in Asia, Latin America, and Europe. Mike is focused on a number of issues at Heritage. He's focused on national identity, multiculturalism, assimilation, critical race theory, and he's written over th he's written three books, the latest of which is the title of our program tonight, BLM, The Making of a New Marxist Revolution. And if you don't have this book, we're going to encourage you to get it. You can go on Amazon to do that. 
Also joining us tonight is James Lindsay. James is an American-born author. That's what he says in his resume. And he's, a math, he's also a mathematician and professional troublemaker. I love that part of it. Uh, he's written six books. Mike, you're behind just a bit, but we'll give you time. Uh, spanning a range of issues, including religion, the philosophy of science, and postmodern theory. He has a new book coming out just today, Race Marxism. He's already getting five stars on Amazon, so I encourage you to check that one out. It just came out today. He's a leading expert on critical race theory, and he is the founder of New Discourses. Ladies and gentlemen, would you please welcome James Lindsay and Mike Gonzalez. but then we're going to open it up to questions from the audience. So please uh, get your questions ready. We want to make this very interactive. Um, Mike, there's so much we can talk about history-wise, how we got to where we are today. But before we do that, I, I want to ask you, how has America been impacted by Black Lives Matter? That's actually a great open question. The, the, the most important thing, I think, that we need to think about is that our lives have deteriorated, have, made, have been made worse. Uh, uh, significantly worse in the last nine years of the existence of Black Lives Matter, especially since 2020. The reason why our children are being indoctrinated in, in the classrooms, our adults are, are going through re-education sessions in their places of work, um, is because of Black Lives Matter. The, 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 the spike in the homicide rate, which is atrocious, in 2020, it was 30 percent, the highest it has ever been. Uh, a rise in crime, a rise in, in, in murders. The, the, the second uh, highest was 1968, another politically charged year, and that was only 12%. 2020 was 30%, and it built up from that in 2021. We can talk about that uh, all, again if you, if you want to. That has a lot to do with the Ferguson effect. The Ferguson effect is what happens when police pull back, they take fewer for proactive actions. This is a very well-documented uh, impact that, uh, that, that, that uh, several papers have been written on it, including two most recently. That's also because of BLM. Uh, and I would go even further and say the fact that most Americans are afraid to speak their mind, to say what they, in public what they believe, is also because of Black Lives Matter. And these things are happening by design. Uh, our lives have deteriorated by design because the leaders of the BLM organizations, the creators, are committed to dismantling the American way of life. To they, 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 want to, uh, they want to abolish not just the police, they want to abolish the capitalism, the family, many aspects of our way of life. And that's because they're Marxists, and they say they're Marxists. And I guess I should say at the beginning, very quickly, that BLM has several components, right? It's got the concept, which is unimpeachable. I say black lives matter. I don't, I don't say all lives matter, even though obviously all lives matter. It's important to say black lives matter to affirm that for reasons that don't even need to be explained. Then there is the movement, <coughs> and that is nebulous. I guess it could mean the, the different chapters, uh, but it usually generally means the marchers, the people who pitch signs on their lawns. And then there's the organization, Black Lives Matter Global Network Foundation, the mothership, and their, and their founders. And they, they were trained for several years before BLM by hardcore Marxist ideologues on Marxism in how to organize new Marxists. That the media never talks about. The media only talks about the concept and the movement. My book, the reason I wrote the book, was about the organization, BLM, GNF, the, the founders, and how our lives are being made progressively worse, and that I consider is a threat to our way of life. James, you have a new book out. It's called Race Marxism, uh, but it kind of plays off the making of a new Marxist revolution. This, this is Marxism but it's got a slightly different way than maybe the way Karl Marx would have, would have looked at this. Speak to that, if you would. Yeah, so, so BLM is the, the popular front, or actually kind of the, the shock troop vanguard of this race Marxist movement to remake America. And so the book that I have is titled Race Marxism. The point of this book is to make it absolutely clear so that everybody who intuits the fact that critical race theory somehow reproduces Marxism with race put in place of class, can stand confidently and understand that they are correct in that intuition. It is, in fact, Marxism that replaces race in the place of economic class. We can, we can go into any level of depth, uh, to painful levels of depth if you want, 
But <clears throat> the very kind of simple, there are kind of two very simple points that can be made to really convince you that, that this is race Marxism. And it's not kind of the little punchy things where I could, you know, say that the founders of critical race theory, for example, Richard Delgado among them, he was interviewed. He was there at the founding conference in, in Madison, Wisconsin in 1989. He was interviewed in the 1990s. What was it like? What was it about? And he says, you know, we were there. We met in an austere room. There were crucifixes here and there, an odd setting for a bunch of Marxists. And so, you know, we could go explicitly in kind of punchy ways, but if we actually look at what, what Marx had, he had two kind of main, well, many, but two really big pieces of his, of, of his theory. And so what I want to convince people of is with, with the idea of race Marxism is that you have the exact same engine, the exact same chassis, and you have different body style on the outside. So the car is basically the same, it just looks different, uh, if, if you follow me. And so the first of these two things is Marx believed that there were two structure, two pieces to society. Everybody thinks I'm about to say the capitalists or the bourgeoisie and then the proletariat or the working class, and they correlate to this, but he actually said that there's a superstructure of society and an infrastructure of society or a base of society, and those two are in what he called dialectical opposition. This is dialectical materialism. And what happens is that the, the superstructure is, is composed of people who don't do productive work. Us. We write things. We speak. We, maybe you're a lawyer or you're a politician and you run your mouth a lot for your job. You don't actually produce anything. And then the infrastructure produces things. They have a hammer in one hand and a sickle in the other, so they harvest the grain and they, they, they hammer out the steel, and they produce the useful things that society needs to have in order to, to thrive. And so these two are in intrinsic conflict, according to Marx. Um, in, in essence, the superstructure is engaged in the business through all of its mouth running and writing of justifying its own existence because what it's actually doing is, is exploiting the, the working class. And to justify its own existence, Marx came up with this concept that we all use today, we all talk about today, and a lot of us don't realize that it was the core concept of Marxist philosophy, which is called ideology. The mythologies that the superstructure, the bourgeoisie, tell themselves as for why we need lawyers to mediate the law, why we need priests and pastors to teach about religion, why we need managers to manage the workers who could manage themselves if we didn't have stupid managers telling them what to do and busting their chops at work. Why we need all this? This is ideology. And they, things like merit. I worked my way to the top. Things like I own this property and so I'm putting it to use and I'm hiring you to do what I want with, with my property so that I can put it to productive use and extract profit off of your labor. These kinds of things, these ideologies that uh, capitalism among them that people put forth are the set of mythologies that justify the oppression of the working class by the managerial class, the exploiting class. This is reproduced exactly in critical race theory, which is the operating system that BLM is running on. This is, and I mean literally exactly, there's a form of private property or bourgeois property as Marx would have it in critical race theory following Cheryl Harris from 1993 called Whiteness. Her paper in 1993 is titled Whiteness as Property. And we were just talking in the office and Mike said, I don't like to quote Robin D'Angelo, but I'm gonna quote Robin D'Angelo. <laughs> Because Robin D'Angelo says at the end of White Fragility, her super ultra twice best-selling book, meaning it had a best-selling run, faded, and then blew back up after BLM jumped onto the scene in 2020 and became a bestseller again, a runaway bestseller both times. She says at page 149, 150, something like this, right near the end of the book, that there's no such thing as a positive white identity and your goal, as Coca-Cola echoed, is to become less white. Marx said that communism can be summarized in a single sentence, the abolition of private property. Critical race theory can be summarized in a single sentence, the abolition of whiteness as the organizing principle of society. People who have access to whiteness have white privilege. They create an ideology called white supremacy that is structural and systemic rather than individual or even institutional. And they organize society in order that that white supremacy and their access to whiteness, which is limited to them and those they choose to give it to, is preserved. And you have a racial conflict theory across the stratification of white versus people of color perfect reproduction. This is one of the two things. I know I'm running long. The second <laughs> is Marx had a historicism. He believed that history follows a trajectory. It starts in a primitive communism. Tribes have, they share everything within the tribe. Eventually tribes learn to dominate one another and they enslave neighboring tribes. This is your first act of domination. Eventually we decide that slavery is an abomination. And so lords and aristocrats run 
states. This is the third stage of history is the feudal estate uh, aristocracy economy, um, a state economy it's usually called. Eventually the serfs say, well, just let me have my own stuff and I can manage it better and I don't have to work for you. And we end up in a fourth stage of history called capitalism. Eventually this causes the workers to realize they're still being exploited. They're being paid wages now instead of being enslaved, but that's still slavery by another name. That's how Marx framed wage slavery. And they eventually will gather together, form a movement exactly like what's happening in Canada right now, and revolt against their masters, and they will seize the means of production. And so not exactly because they want freedom, they, they will seize the means of production and establish an administered economy that makes outcomes equal, called socialism or equity, whichever word you prefer. And this will eventually become spontaneous and a sixth stage of history will arise when the classes have been completely dissolved, the state is unnecessary to manage it, and so as Marx put it, it will wither away. The state by itself will decide it doesn't need to exist anymore <laughs> by magic because everything's working according to plan without it, and we'll enter a classless, stateless society at the end of history, literally the end of history, as Marx framed what history means, called communism. This is a utopia. Re critical race theory reproduces this identically as well. At the beginning, there are, if you read how they write about Native Americans or First Nations people or whatever, they, whatever euphemism they use, they tell you, that they were, you know, in the tribes, everybody who's a member of the tribe shares equally. You have racial justice. There is no race within the tribe, but the tribes are racially estranged from one another. One starts to dominate another. Eventually, chattel slavery is invented. Racial slavery is invented. Eventually, we have an abolition movement. This enters into a third stage of history, which is in racial aristocracy, where you have white race as a racial upper class, and then you have a racial lower class that's separate but equal, but we all know not equal. We have Jim Crow laws, we have apartheid states, whatever it happens to be. So there's a racial aristocracy, and it's a perfect parallel to the aristocrat states that Marx was describing. Then we have a civil rights movement, and people say, no, we're going to judge by the content of character, not the color of skin. We enter into a colorblind equality that they say just masks the inequities of society better. Eventually, you'll have a rising up by the anti-racists who recognize this. They're trained critical race theorists who see how the system itself, regardless of anybody's intentions or actions, is itself racist. The racism is structural, as I just described with the ideology component, and they will seize the means primarily of cultural and structural production rather than material production and enter us into an administered state by the state itself. Ibram Kendi, who Mike also doesn't like to quote, <laughs> said that we are going to produce a department of anti-racism. By the way, over here on the Hill, they are actually trying this. The Democrats and the squad are trying to create a cabinet-level position for a department of anti-racism right now with $70 billion behind it because they can't get the constitutional amendment that Ibram Kendi asked for, which would have full jurisdiction over all state, local, and federal policy, as well as private policy, as well as expressions of racist ideas by public officials with the power to punish people who don't willfully relinquish them. Marx called his program the dictatorship of the proletariat. Kendi's program should be called not the Department of Anti-Racism DOA, but the dictatorship of the anti-racists DOA. And we'll enter into a managed economy called equity, or socialism, if you prefer the word. Eventually, this will become spontaneous. We won't need the state and the DOA any longer to uh, maintain it, so it will become DOA, uh, dead on arrival. <laughs> At which point, we will finally achieve justice, racial justice. And justice becomes a new word, the repackaging of communism. Uh, how do we know that this is the case? Well, take, for example, uh, when George Floyd died, I guess he technically, uh, his, 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 uh, um, the police officer arresting him was convicted, Derek Chauvin, was convicted so we can say when he was murdered. I hate to say that. I actually say when he died pretty strictly. But he was convicted of three counts, and what happened AOC, Bernie Sanders, et cetera, are on television, on social media, within five to 10 minutes saying this was not justice, this was accountability. Justice comes later. Justice is a long process. Justice means communism. The real name, by the way, just to kind of really put a nail in this coffin for you, the real name for what we call equity came from a man named H. George Fredrickson working in public administration in 1968, and its real name is social equity theory. So social equity leads in the long run, when it becomes spontaneous, to social justice. So social justice means communism. Social equity means 
socialism that will be seized out of the state of colorblind equality, which is tantamount to, if you will, racial capitalism, where people can do as they will, and we don't judge people at the level of laws or policy by the color of their skin any longer. And we try not to on the individual level as well. So this is race Marxism, and I think that's pretty easy to understand. That's it. Let me, let me just, no. yeah, let me just no. comment on this very quickly, because he, he raised so many good points. But one is that this idea that justice it's just a veneer behind which they, they, they hide their, their attempt. What they're trying to do is to use beautiful slogans like Black Lives Matter or social justice. But what they really want to do is change society. And that's the reason I was compelled to write my book. They want to change the American way of life. The American, America is not perfect by any means. America, you know, anything can withstand improvement. But America is pretty, pretty good. You know, I was born overseas. I have lived as a foreign correspondent uh, in seven places at least a year. I see one of my fellow foreign correspondents there. We met in Korea in the 80s. And I can tell you that I, I can compare and contrast. And, and America compares very, very well with the rest of the world. So I am completely against the idea that we need to, because, this, because we have systemic racism, we need to throw the system out. This is what I want to alert people to. That they, they, this is now that Black Lives Matter GNF is getting into a lot of because there's a lot of reports of financial malfeasance, and and people are beginning to attack it even from the left, and they're saying, well, they don't really, they haven't really improved Black lives. They haven't. They where's the money? There's tens of millions of dollars missing, but they don't mention the Marxism. But the Marxism is the key because they, they don't want to improve. What they want to do is abolish the family, abolish the state, and abolish capitalism. And they say that. They, it's in the public record. If, if we but quoted them, well, I do, but the media does not. They, and I'm glad that James mentioned the, the Canadian truckers because we see a prime example today of an actual workers' revolt taking place just north of the, bo of the border, and what has the media done? What has, what has the left done? I'm, but I repeat myself. What has the left done? <clears throat> it has collectively held its nose at this, at, at this actual bona fide workers' revolt for the reasons that James said. Both the, I, this is not the first time we speak together, so I know that we both like to quote Herbert Marcuse, the, the critical theorist, critical race theory comes from critical theory. The critical theorist, a German who came to the United States and tried to overthrow the United States, the, 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 the guru of the new left, the guru of the sexual revolution, and he, he, he noticed, <coughs> he, he, he knew he was really, really upset that the workers were not rising up to, to, to overthrow the system. <coughs> the American workers were just as bad as the European workers. They were loyal to God. The, the worker liked his family. The worker liked his nation state. And the worker very much liked his private property. So he had, the worker has false, false consciousness, and, and he liked all of the things that Marx said that needed to be abolished. So then he started noticing the race riots in the 60s. Herbert Marcuse from his uh, plush offices at, uh, at, at Brandeis or San Diego, at the University of San Diego. And it reminded him of the workers' revolts in his native Germany in 1919, which had failed to establish a German Soviet. But then he said, ah, it, it will be from the ghetto population, his words. It will be the, the people of all the classes and all the races and colors who will overthrow the system. They don't have, they need us, the communist intellectuals, to give them revolutionary uh, consciousness but they will overthrow the system. And, and that is really what we have today. We, and there's a beautiful speech uh, that, that somebody gave uh, at, the, at the beginning of the New Left at Berkeley. Uh, one of the, 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 the radical students said, the worker has gone uh, to, 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 the, to the right, the worker is conservative, uh, and it's going to be the students. And we, we see these two groups, the, the students back then, the radical students, have taken over the university, have taken over academia, and they're using social justice, uh, uh, the, the plight of black Americans as a pretext mm. to overthrow our system. Folks, this is a very serious thing. We need to pay attention to it because, as I said, our lives are being worsened very rapidly uh, because people refuse to talk about this. I want to open up to questions, but let me ask you one more question, Mike, and then we'll go to the audience. So you look at the cover of your book. This was, this was 2020. Many Kenosha, of us saw yeah. That was Kenosha, these. yeah. Uh, what happened? Where are the riots now? They're over. They're they superfluous. You don't need the, 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 they don't need to riot. The, 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 the leaders of our elite institutions all threw in the towel. Critical race theories in K-12, critical race theories in the boardroom, critical race theories on the factory floor. It's in, 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 in offices. It is in the houses of worship. It is in the military. It's in the, in, 
you know, sports leagues. The, the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York has now, is now going to, to really uh, to, to, to add, to interrogate Western art, but is going to put third world art on a pedestal. And our, our origin story is being questioned and being dismantled. No, we did not start in 1776. We actually started as a society in 1619. It doesn't get more fundamental than a country and a people's and a nation's origin story, and that is what's being dismantled right now and replaced. All right, let's open it up to questions. If you have one, just raise your hand, and we will bring a this mic back there. over to you. Oh, well, we got a lot. Go ahead. Please state your name, if you would. Much for your remarks. This is uh, very clarifying. Could you just please um, uh, one more point of clarity for me? Is it sounds like the uh, Marxist interpretation of everything was through the economic lens. So you've got the you know those with capital uh, and then the workers, and then at some point, and it sounds like you're saying it's Marcusa. If I'm saying that Marcusa, right, Marcusa. Yeah, that's when it kind of flipped and began. The, the prism sort of shifted, and now we're seeing it through you know race because basically Western Europe and America were prosperous, so the workers didn't, you know, it wasn't like, you know, Russian serfdom, so there was no real need for them to, it, it wasn't working the way that Marx predicted. So is it Mercusa where we begin seeing things through race? Is that where that switch was flipped? Let me give you a, a brief explanation, then flip it over to James. James has really written a lot on this. He's, he's been kind of a mentor to me on many things. But it really begins in the 20s. When the two biggest industrial states in Europe, Italy and Germany, both fail to establish a Soviet, they both have revolutions in 1919, they fail, and then communists go into a deep blue funk. Uh, communist intellectuals in both states are going like, why did we do this? Why did, we, why did it fail? In Germany, in Italy, it was really Antonio Gramsci. The, the, the Mussolini made a huge mistake by putting him in prison. The prosecutor said, we have to stop his brain from working. Duh, that doesn't happen in prison, as we know from the, from the examples of, of St. Paul. And, and Gramsci wrote a lot while sitting in prison about uh, uh, why the worker was not rising and false consciousness. And then the Germans were much more organized. They were Germans, and they, they, they established a think tank uh, called the, the Frankfurt That was a racist comment. <laughs> no, no, the, the Frankfurt School, uh, the, the, the Institute of Social Research, and, and they both pretty much said the same thing. The, the Frankfurt School said that there was a, a, a conceptual superstructure. His name on, on Twitter is Conceptual James. Uh, and, and the conceptual superstructure creates uh, reality Whereas uh, Gramsci's idea was the, 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 it, it, there's a hegemonic narrative that needs to be overthrown. The worker has bought into the hegemonic narrative. But these both say that the worker does not understand his own oppression. Uh, a, the worker is being oppressed, but does, does not really see it. The, the critical theorists come to the United States uh, in the 30s, and Marcuse is one of them. And he, they, 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 they leave the capitalist cell of California in the 40s as soon as we liberate Germany, but Marcuse stays behind and causes a lot of trouble. And I would put it with the new left that he helped found in the 60s where it turned, uh, at the turning point was from worker to race. I don't know if you have a different explanation. For that. No, that, <clears throat> that's largely correct. Um, I would endorse <laughs> that. I want to just add, I actually want to add detail to the Marcusean element to this and to, to the 1920s element. There were two kind of things going on. The, the communists realized that race was a very powerful tool in well-established countries. So there were two countries in which they unleashed what we would now recognize as critical race theory, but they were very ham-fisted where they did it in the United States, being one of those two. And kind of racial Marxism didn't take off in the United States up through, say, the 1950s or, or whatever. Um, the other was in China, which was very successful, as a matter of fact. Uh, a lot of people don't know Mao Zedong was actually involved in the CCP, but he also joined the Kuomintang in 1923. That's the Chinese Nationalist Party uh, that Chiang Kai-shek ended up being in charge of. And so from 1923 through 1949, when the Communist Revolution happened in China, what you had was the CCP was slowly putting out this narrative. The, the Kuomintang had put out a flag that was five stripes of all these different colors. I don't know what the colors were specifically, but these five stripes were to represent all of the different possible races and, and views of, of China in equality. And uh, they came up with this concept called Huaren, which means Chinese person, uh, kind of in sort of s shorthand slang or whatever. And so the CCP started sowing this narrative that, no, you're not truly Chinese people. There are 55 racial minorities in the Chinese uh, provinces, and you are actually being assimilated into Han Chinese 
racial dominance. And they started this whole thing, and they had these same concepts, Han supremacy, being a good Han, uh, as opposed to you know a, a bad Han or whatever. And we have these same concepts in critical race theory, white supremacy, being a good white, trying to appease the racial minorities or whatever it happens to be. Good white liberals uh, is, a, is their favorite hobby horse to attack. So they actually unleashed critical race theory to destabilize the Chinese society, where it actually kind of worked, leading up to the 1949 revolution. So there's depth there. The communists knew that race would work. It didn't work in its first iteration in the United States. Uh, black communists, black communism never really took off. The black yeah. uh, communities in the United States largely recognized that communism yeah. is not going to be good for the black man either. And so they rejected it, and they had a very hard time with that. They didn't know how to do the narratives. Marcuse comes along looking at the black power, the black liberation movement, et cetera, which you'll also notice is BLM. Uh, as its founders also noticed, uh, the BLM Black Liberation Movement mm -hmm. and BLM Black Lives Matter have the same initials, and they're really the same program, just in two forms. Uh, but what Marcuse said is that basically the working class has abandoned us. He and his compatriot, Max Horkheimer, both came to this conclusion. Max Horkheimer's um, summary is pretty succinct. He said Marx believed that, that capitalism would, would immiserate the workers, and it did not. It allowed them to build a better life. Marcuse took it a step further, and he said it stabilized the working class. The working class is becoming conservative, even a counter-revolutionary force. And so we have a problem. And he says explicitly in his 1969 essay on liberation, we need a new working class. A new working class. The real working class is not a good working class. It won't become a proletariat. It won't overthrow the system. It stabilized. It became conservative. Substitute working class, I think. Yeah. yeah. And so he says we need this. And where he says to look, in his own words, as Mike said, is, is in the ghetto populations, in the feminists, in the sexual minorities, in the unemployed, and in the general outcast, by which he mostly meant like the weather underground, uh, which was, by the way, almost wholly white, or maybe wholly white by definition. They, they, they separated themselves from the black people, saying that the black people had their own nation and had to come at it from a kind of a black nationalist perspective. So Marcuse sets this flame, and in particular, he indoctrinates his one of his doctoral students by the name of Angela Davis, who is a very hardened Marxist. Uh, Davis said explicitly that Marcuse is the one who radicalized her the first of two times. Visiting Palestine is the second of her two radicalizations. And what a lot of people don't realize is this is where, what, what Marcuse did was he built an exit ramp off of the, the economic interstate of Marxism, and it joined up with, a, with an identity politics uh, interstate for Marxism to follow. And people like Angela Davis eventually informing the so-called Combahee River Collective in the 1970s, 74 through maybe 78, 79 it lasted. In 77, they put out a statement saying it's very communist, it's very obviously communist, saying that they were going to do this new intersectional identity politics. That's where the term identity politics in the modern form is actually coined, is in the Combahee River Collective statement of 1977. And so over the course of the 70s and then going into the 80s and by 1995 or so, you have this kind of awakening of a Marxist identity politics. I call this the awakening of identity Marxism, uh, where most of mainline Marxist activism took the exit ramp that Marcuse built. So if you think of it in that metaphor, Marcuse didn't flip the switch so much as he built the exit ramp. And then what largely was not just black power radicals, but specifically lesbian black feminists, very specifically, who were these trained Marxists, as Colors put her in her uh, in her her little speech that was in the video at the beginning. They were the they're the predecessors to that. They are the ones who started to to create the intersectional identity politics that is identity Marxism. Intersectionality's right name is identity Marxism, and so they created this. And by 1995, you have Gloria Ladson Billings, who's working in education now yeah. to this day. Yeah. She's the chief author of the Ed Equity Virginia program, for example, just south of here, of course. And um, she wrote in 1995 in a paper called Toward a Critical Race Theory of Education, because it's not in schools. She wrote in 1995 in there that critical race theory, the point of it is to make race the central construct for understanding inequality. So by 1995, I would say that that was a done deal. Race had replaced class for understanding inequality. The reason was the resentment that people like Horkheimer and Marcuse felt toward the working class for betraying the revolutionary potential. Uh, and so they turned what Marcuse called the vital needs existed in these ghetto populations. And so if you could just indoctrinate and program the students to deliver the Marxist theory to the racial minorities who were pissed off in the, in the ghetto, 
then they would be able to rise up and slowly turn to overthrow the system. And it was the black feminists who really created the monstrosity that we're working with first, you know, through the 70s and then with the final architecture being done roughly by 95. And in fact, who is the, who do the BLM leaders recognize as their intellectual mentor? Angela Davis. They, they, they say this all the time. They say in interviews with her, Angela Davis writes the foreword to a book by Colors, <clears throat> and Alicia Garza is effusive about how much they owe Angela Davis. This contact tracing you can see from BLM leaders to Angela Davis, who was taught philosophy by Marcuse. And you actually can take it back. Marcuse studied under Martin Heidegger, an actual member of the Nazi party. And, and, and Heidegger was the head of the, of the Nietzsche Institute in Germany in the 1920s, a, a very close friend of Nietzsche's very anti-Semitic Nazi sister. Angel Davis is not just a communist. She was an actual member of the party who ran as VP on the Communist Party ticket and, in fact, told Julian Bond that she found communists did not go far enough. They were boring. They were old-fashioned. Her parents were communists. She wanted to take it much further than that. Um, so that is um, that gives you some idea. Uh, by the way, and, and this would what James just said about the, the use of different things. <clears throat> Eric Mann, a former weatherman, and that's not a guy on TV, but a member of the Weather <laughs> on the Ground, um, went to prison, very key communist. He actually said in an interview <clears throat> that communists have a little division of labor. He uses those terms. They, 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 they use sex, they use gender, they use race, they use climate, but the purpose is to overthrow the United States. And these things are just a little division of labor. I sent it to Jay Richards over there when I, when, when I, when I saw the transcript of the interview, uh, because I, they, they, they are so transparent in the way they say these things. Um, anyway, just... If you want one more little connection, by the way, kind of the landmark intersectionality papers by Kimberly Crenshaw, who's credited with naming critical race theory. Uh, one of the, she's credited as being kind of the uh, originator of crit critical race theory, along with her mentor, Derek Bell. And her most famous paper is called Mapping the Margins from 1991. And in one of the first footnotes of that paper, she credits Angela Davis with much of the intellectual and activist spirit that motivates her work. Sir. Uh, hi, Jonathan Greenberg from Northbrook, Illinois, um, the bluest part of blue Illinois. <laughs> um, and actually, that's what I wanted to ask about. I, um, Dr. Lindsay, you mentioned earlier that people are able to listen to this and intuit that there's something wrong with it. Um, I think that's really true. I hear from my deep blue neighbors all the time whispering to me because I'm their one conservative friend uh, and I'm a safe address for this, that, that they think that there's something wrong. And so what I would ask the two of you, other than buying your book, which is a great first step, how do we create a permission structure for people who know this is wrong to say so? You know, go ahead and say it. I mean, if you don't have evil in your heart, if you don't have hatred, you can actually say anything you want. Because what we want to, they're not helping anybody, nor do they want to help. The, the, all of the policy remedies will do more harm to people of all races. If you get rid of the family, the family is actually the central institution. Without the family, there's just no chance of success. BLM, if you go to their website, BLM GNF, they don't want to just defund the police. They want to abolish, and we can get into which definition of abolish. They, they, they want to abolish... The, 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 the prison system and the court system, no society can survive that way. They want to abolish capitalism because capitalism, according to them, uh, rewards the wrong criteria. Uh, and, 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 and black lives cannot matter under capitalism. That is false, and capitalism is actually just really colorblind. If you build a better, a better mousetrap, you're going to become wealthy. You're going to be rewarded. Uh, but they think that is actually reward. That's the wrong criteria to reward. Um, so, if I would, I've done it. I, I'm still around. I, I, I speak quite openly about this. He speaks quite openly about this. He's still around. He's still sitting there. Um, you, you know, you 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 have to. It's like it's like the polls after John Paul II came and they come out. They came out in the 1980s and they saw each other and they said, "Oh, well, there's more of us than there's of them." And, and we're going to lose our fear. Let's lose our fear. You know, you want to... I mean, I would tell you to generally, you know, not use buzzwords that have political resonance. So if you come at people and say, I think critical race theory is terrible, you know, then they hear critical race theory, they think Team Blue is supposed to like that, Team Red hates that. Okay, that's as deep as, as it goes. And you get that kind of back against the wall, political identity gets invoked, and all of a sudden, you know, you're not having a conversation anymore. If you actually bring up 
facts about things that are actually happening. I, I found, to be honest with you, the most powerful sentence that I know of for getting people to, to see something is that I don't know about all this. Just to s express skepticism in the face of it. You don't have to come out guns blazing and say, oh, it's race Marxism. Well, you know, maybe you can and maybe you can't, but it's not productive in my experience. I don't think there's a greater expert at that than, than I am. I don't have a lot of success with that approach, but if I say, I don't know about all this, usually the reply I get is, well, here's something I don't know all about, and they'll say something you know, for example, I had a young woman come to me one day and said, I need to confess something. And I was like, oh, that's weird. Okay, let's do it. And she's like, she's like, I'm done with the pronouns. And then she starts crying because she says that she's never been able to tell people. She didn't think she could ever admit that she's done with the pronouns. And so then the next step from there, I'll tell you about my experience. A lot of you will have seen me go on Dr. Phil. And I'm very famous now because I went on Dr. Phil's television show. I'm great daytime TV, as it turns out. And <laughs> what happened and I don't want to get anybody in trouble, so I won't name anybody, but one person after another on his staff came back to my dressing room, and they whispered, you know, I agree with everything you say. I'm so glad you're here. Don't tell anybody else. And I eventually was like, you know, everybody else here has said that. Maybe you guys should start talking to each other. And what you're asking, how do you create that permission slip, is cluing people in. Look, you don't have to talk to me. Maybe I'm a conservative or whatever you say, you know. Maybe you don't trust me as a source. But I, I promise you, I'm hearing, I'm, I'm like your one conservative friend. So I'm hearing it from you, and I'm hearing it from you, and I'm hearing it from you. I'm hearing it from everybody in the neighborhood. And literally, every one of you is afraid that the other ones aren't buying in. And none of you are buying in. So talk to each other. Mention it to your friend. You want me to set up a lunch? You know, let's go out. <laughs> and I won't even say anything. You know, so getting them talking to one another is probably going to be more fruitful. But then to bring up these blatant contradictions, like Mike was very polite. He talks about the trucker, the workers' revolt that's happening in Canada. We don't just have there, as a matter of fact, the left and the media saying, you know, this is terrible, they're fascists, et cetera. You literally had the Communist Party of Canada come out on Twitter and denounce this thing. The communists denounced a workers' revolt. <laughs> <laughs> These are the kinds of contradictions that people have a hard time reckoning or reconciling when they're confronted with them. You know, everywhere that these diversity programs have been implemented in schools, what we're seeing is lower literacy rates. We're seeing lower mathematics, you know, uh, competency rates. Why is that? And how do we hold accountable the fact that these things aren't actually helping? Then if you want to add in points like, well, for every minute that they spend doing critical race theory, say through a math lesson, which they are doing, and you can find easy examples of that online, every minute they spend doing that, they're not actually teaching your kid algebra. They're not teaching your kid arithmetic. They don't know how to do long division, and it's because they're wasting time doing this other stuff. What do you actually think about that? And then showing them these kinds of you know, failures and contradictions actually does get people's attention. It's difficult to know what will resonate with any given person. Another technique I found that's very effective for that is asking them, if X were happening, where would you say that's enough? Something's wrong with this. And I, I, you know, a year ago or a year and a half ago when I first proposed that, a lot of people had never thought of it. Now everybody, everybody I ask now has an answer. Oh, if they were doing, well, if they were sexually grooming children in schools, well, let me show you something. Let me show you this book called Gender Queer. <laughs> and let me show you what's in it. Have you, I have a woman I just worked with in Kansas. She has in her purse at all times a copy of that book and will pull it out and show people, physically show them. It's about yay thick, graphic novel, and it's very graphic. This is, and then she'll say, the point of this is not that this exists. The point of this is not that it's in school libraries, which is already alarming. It's that if you try to take this out of a school library, they go berserk. Why are they so hellbent on keeping this book, which contains obvious graphic drawings of pornography, obvious sexualization of children, obvious grooming, to any reasonable, fair-minded person, especially anybody who has, parent, or has children, understands that this is abhorrent and does not belong. Why? It's not why does it exist. It's why are they fighting like hell to keep it in a library to the point of doxing parents or all these. Why are they so, why can't they let it go? That question alarms people. So you have to look for different things that will catch people on what I would call their woke breaking point and mostly get them talking to each other. We have so many questions. We are up against time, but I'm going to take one more question. We'll go to this gentleman right here, and then we'll have a closing comment from Mike. Go ahead. Hi, thank you. Um, I'm just wondering, what does all of this mean for, you know, how we can go up against China and Russia? <clears throat> does this play into their hands? And if so, kind of, what do we have to do about this when, let's say, 2022 goes away, it's probably going to go, and 2024 
follows. Like, is the response to go in and take their own tactics and start banning them left and right or calling them out? Or is there another approach that we have to take, like kind of explaining it pieces by pieces? Okay, so what I would say is that there are actually two fights happening that you have to be aware of, and I'll come back to the China-Russia thing. But as far as, you know, what, what kind of, what are our trajectory going forward? Do we have to take up their tactics, et cetera? No, we should take up a refined version of their tactics. So everybody who's in a position of power that's abusing it should be removed. Everybody who is in a position of power who is abusing it, add that clause, should be removed. So people like the squad who are abusing their power in Congress by bullying everybody, by calling everything they don't like racist, should be voted out. So we're removing them by legal means. Maybe some of them deserve impeachment, depending on what they've done. So that's a legal means. So we're not using their tactics. We're being responsible. If they're implementing genderqueer in a school library as an administrator, that person should probably have their, their employment prospects challenged because they're engaging in, in something you know, beyond the pale or with regard to children. So you have to, you have to do a refinement of their tactics. You don't take out or cancel that which you don't like. You take out abuses of power, very specifically that are very easy to articulate. This will eventually come to class action lawsuits in a lot of cases of various different types. We could probably sue the DEI industry for selling a fraudulent product. Who knows what's going to come down in medical malpractice with all of the trans stuff. Right. It's going to be grotesque. It's going to be, I, every young person who says, I'm thinking about going to law school. What should I specialize in? I'm like, medical malpractice law. <laughs> there is a river of gold in that direction, <laughs> young person. So the, that, that's the practical side. The second side is, is there is a cultural battle going on. There's a spiritual, if you even will, battle going on for the kind of the soul of people and the country. Marxism rots the soul of a country and of the people within it. It demoralizes people by definition. That's their project. And so that's where you have to go pieces by pieces and explain, this is what this is. This is what the answer is. The answer is actually to do exactly the opposite of whatever they want. So I refuse to say Black Lives Matter because they want me to. Even though it's a totally defensible sentence, I don't mean to disagree with my friend Mike here, I won't say it because they want me to. So I refuse to play any of their games. Um, and you have to find that way to find a healthy path toward civic renewal, individual and spiritual renewal, as the children say, you have to get based. Um, that's a cultural thing. Now, what about China and Russia? I know, that, I know less about Russia and its, its motivations. I know that it's recently partnered with Xi. I don't know what the program with that is for sure. But I do know that the Chinese were well behind the curve on this. For a long time, they made fun of wokeness. There's even a word in Chinese, baisuo. That, that means white left. It, it literally means white left. And they used it to make fun of left-wing Americans. And then about a year and a half ago, their propaganda accounts, their Wumao accounts on social media stopped making fun of the Baiso and started inflaming, the, inflaming this. And then, of course, there's that famous you know, meeting in Alaska where they came straight out and said, oh, how are you going to criticize us for the Uyghurs when you have a racial injustice problem? Look at George Floyd. You know, they immediately started to manipulate this. So China was behind the eight ball but figured this out. So you can tell by the fact that they're weaponizing it in political warfare somewhat clumsily that they understand that it's a massive strategic advantage for them to push this. And so it behooves us as a country to get over this sooner rather than later for national security reasons. Now, broadly, again, I don't know Russia's plans. I don't even know what China's up against. Their housing market is uh, teetering, we'll say, to be very friendly to what seems to be really happening with their, their market. Uh, I don't know what that all portends. But what I do know is that having a woke military is a national security threat to the point where we should be acting as though there's a 10-alarm fire in the building and we're doing something about it. That right. is a national security threat beyond, it doesn't matter whether it's Russia, whether it's China, whether it's North Korea, whether it's freaking Nicaragua, it doesn't matter who it is. If we have a woke military, we are going to lose a major war, and probably even a minor war again. It is a catastrophe it, it waiting to happen. It is a national security threat beyond any national security threat that we face to see the wokeification of our military. So lawmakers, policymakers need to be taking it. I know Tom Cotton's very good at this, for example. You'd be taking it very, very seriously and trying to get uh, these woke policies and woke generals who are abusing their power by making what is, Millie tells us he cares a lot about white rage, which is repackaging a white fragility. No, gone. Thank you. You know, retired. So I think that that's the, the kind of relevant thing to say. The, our, our adversaries around the world are going to know this is a moment of weakness 
for the United States, and they're looking at what we're doing in our military, and I guarantee you they're laughing. China, I know, is laughing because they're making videos about how manly their soldiers are, and they have them out like shirtless in the snow, slapping snow all over themselves, show muscles everywhere, sweat glistening. I saw a video where they had the sweat dripping, and it was freezing cold in Tiananmen Square of a soldier. They had icicles hanging off the back, and he's like, look how manly the Chinese military is. Versus this, and then they're showing like you know a gay navy ship painted like rainbows or something. I'm not joking. This is the kind of stuff that they're putting out. They know this is a moment of weakness. It's something that I, I make it funny, but it's extremely serious. Yeah, no, they uh, look. China and Russia both love this. Uh, the, the Chinese Progressive Associations of, of uh, Boston and San Francisco, or the, the one in San Francisco is a fiscal sponsor of a couple of BLM groups. Uh, they, they 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 were both set up. Uh, to be pro, uh, pro the PRC, pro the People's Republic of China. Um, uh, Russia completely loves this. If you listen to, to Sputnik Radio, uh, they have a critical hour. They have, we're, we're, we're tearing up ourselves from within. Uh, we're tearing up our military. We're tearing up our social structure. They love nothing more than this. Um, and they, 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 in China itself, the People's Republic of China, has written about uh, what Black Lives Matter is, is doing. Uh, this is a, a we, we're doing to ourselves what they couldn't have done in, in their dream uh, by tearing ourselves apart this way. Uh, so it is, it, it, you know, it, 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 we, the world is a dangerous place. Uh, the fact that our enemies love and cite and support, you know, what we're doing is something that should be very concerning to all of us. Mike, final question for you. Um, I know there's a number of reasons you, you wrote this book, and we've talked about a lot of them tonight, but what's the one takeaway you would want people, both here and all those that are watching, uh, to take from the book and why you, why you chose to write it? That they are, <laughs> this, these are Marxist organizations. You know, I, I, you know I, I, I quoted Eric Mann earlier. Eric Mann is, 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 is a former weather on the ground guy who, who spent time in prison. Um, Patrice Coulors, one of the founders of Black Lives Matter, was recruited by Eric Mann's organization and, and worked there for 10 years. Um, you know, they, 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 their purpose is to destroy America from within. Patrice Coulors, that's what she learned to say, I am a trained Marxist. Uh, they don't want to hide this. This is a, a, a well thought out campaign to, to Destroy America from within has nothing to do with uh, fixing our social problems, fixing uh, which we do. We have, you know, we. I'm not against having a dialogue constantly about who, you know, the things that we need to do. But we're a we're the freest country on earth. You know, we have to have a, a long, hard think before. We think that we need such structural change because we're systemically racist or structurally racist in a sense that in, to, to the degree that we have to overthrow uh, the system, that we have to overthrow the structure and come up with a new one. Uh, and that's, that's really why I felt compelled to write the book. Well, it's a great book. And I know Race Marxism is going to be a great book as well, and you can get that out one today. too. It's out today. Uh, but I will say for those you were asking, what can you do? I think so many people in 2020, if you remember watching a lot of the riots and the things that were going on, you looked around and people were like, I don't even recognize this. This doesn't even look like my country. And I, I know it's bad, but I don't really understand it all. This really gives you a great understanding of it. And I think the more that other people understand, so you can give it out as gifts, and it's, it's, an, it's a hard read, but it's an easy read. It's not just intellectual stuff. It's like, oh, I don't want to put it. It's a really fast read. I, Mike gave me this a week ago. I took it to my parents, and I couldn't read it because they kept taking it from me. So they had to give me another <laughs> copy. Uh, but no, it's, it, so I think it gives people, when they know what's going on, I think it gives people a little bit more courage to stand up because they have an understanding of what's happening. So thank you for writing this. Thank you, Thank Jason, you. for all the work that you've done and the book that you have coming out as well. Thank you all for being here. Thank you for everybody who joined us online. Have a wonderful evening. Thank you.